This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. I have two speaking gigs coming up soon. On November 19th, I'll be speaking in Des Moines, Iowa, and the following day, November 20th, I'll be in Chicago, speaking at the famous Beat Kitchen Club. For more information and to get your tickets, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash talks. This episode is about being a heretic, but also a traditionalist. It's about being treated like the devil when you believe in God. This is my interview with Robert Mariani. So a lot of people know that I moved back to the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, my hometown, a few months ago. And uh, ever since then, I've been surrounded by people who all agree against me on virtually every issue. And it's, it's been a challenge, I must say, in particular um, in intimate relations, friends, family, and others. Then I found out that there was a, a new magazine or a relatively new magazine, an online magazine that was at least one of their editors was based in San Francisco that... I understood to be an alt-right magazine, and I thought, this can't be. I looked it up. It's called Jacobite. I think it might be a play or a, maybe a little poke at Jacobin, the communist magazine in Brooklyn. Well, I'll ask the editor in a second this. But it turns out that once I started reading Jacobite, that it is not really alt-right in any meaningful way. It is far more interesting and intelligent and different, I think, certainly than anything you'll see in the Bay Area, but anything you'll see, I think, in the what's known as the alt-right. I think it's a, a fascinating, outstanding, actually, intellectual, political journal of opinion. Believe it or not, Robert Mariani, thanks for coming to this show and being on the show. You're one of the editors. You're one of the founders of Jacobite. Right? I am. And thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Absolutely. And uh, I've been just really impressed with the quality of the writing and the thinking in it. It is... You guys identify as right wing in certain ways, but then you just told me before we started recording that you've had communists write for you, you've had trans people write for you. Not that a trans person can't be right wing, but you do sort of identify broadly with the right. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. But not. But you sort of are not so, not fans of what's called the alt right. So I'm not entirely clear what the ideology of Jacobite is, which is great. That's a credit to you and to your magazine. Uh, one thing I do notice is that you invoke this idea of exit, mm -hmm. which uh, the great soci social scientist Albert Hirschman uh, came up with in his book Voice, Loyalty, and Exit. Is that right? Exit. Uh, that's uh, they voice, mix it up. Voice, loyalty, and exit. That's voice, right. loyalty, and exit. Yep. Yeah, and in which he makes the argument that you know you basically have two choices within any regime. You can choose to participate through your voice to change it if you want to change it. Or you can just leave right. in various ways. And there's, uh, of course, loyalty. And then there's loyalty, <laughs> right, which is just saluting the flag and doing Which what is how told. we Catholics behave in our, our various uh, contorted ways. Right, and you're a Catholic, the church. which is also very interesting. We'll get into that. <laughs> so the, what's funny about the Hirschman thesis is that he takes the side of voice because he's a sure. good liberal, right? That's, yeah. what, that's the liberal, and many conservatives do too. Choice, democracy through democratics, through voting, through speaking, through protest and all of that. Which, you know, I've talked about on this show many times. To me, it's just utterly exhausting, and I'm not interested. It's also not my country. I didn't invent it. It's not my government. I have no interest in managing other people. So I've rejected the voice option for quite a while. I like exit. So when I saw that this was a 
right leaning or right identifying or maybe conservative in some ways magazine that also identifies with the exit strategy mm -hmm. or exit politics, I would even call it. I got very excited. Then I started reading you guys. And I, what I love is, as I said, it's hard to suss out precisely a, a coherent or not coherent, a discrete ideology, sure. which is great. And it is every word in it. And this, this is the fav my favorite thing about it. Every word in it is the exact opposite of what I hear every single day living in this town. So I just want to thank you for existing, for surviving, for living in this town, and for putting out these ideas, at least in part, from the world center, I got to say it, of what has become a cult, I think, left politics in this country. And I come from the left wing in the Bay Area, so I know something about it. It's become imbued with religious thinking, cult-like behavior, and I just don't think there's any disputing it, and it's because there's very little debate about the basic ideas. Everyone agrees here on the basic ideas, pretty much everyone I agree with. And along comes you and Jacobite. I mean, I know it's, it's not, a, it's a national or international, it's an <laughs> online magazine, but you know, the fact that you happen to live here, I just thought was bizarre and amazing, and I wanted to ask you first, what is it like to live here, and you live in San Francisco, what is it like to live here and think totally differently about politics and much of the world than virtually everyone you interact with? Um, well, first of all, thank you for what is maybe the most charitable possible <laughs> introduction I could have gotten. Yeah? Uh, yeah no, I think it's I, I accurate. Could, I think it's accurate. I could do better. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, it's, so I, I, I moved here about a year and a half ago, but, uh, April 2018. Um, from and this is San Francisco, so this is the most liberal, the most liberal city in the country. Uh, I moved from the second most liberal city in the country, and it's Washington D.C. Now I worked in journalism and nonprofits there, and you know uh, I was a conservative there too. Uh, nonetheless, despite like the similar voting patterns of the populaces, this is a very different place mm. for a conservative to live in. Um, and this, a story I like to tell is. I, I was sitting in a restaurant uh, with my girlfriend. It's about a month and a half in. And I, wasn't, I didn't quite understand the differences between these two cities and like their, their, their brand mm. of liberalism or their approach to liberalism or progressivism. Um, and you know, my girlfriend at the time was a feminist, and she was talking about some feminist ideas that I think are just straightforwardly wrong. I was being diplomatic about it, but I was just like, uh, she was saying something, and I was like, I don't think, I don't, what if that's not true? Um, and it, we did this for about 10 minutes, and we were in close quarters with what was apparently a lesbian couple next to us. Um, and when they were finished, when they got their check and they were finished, they stood up and they said, fuck you, you're an asshole, she's right, like, go to hell. They're saying everything to me. Uh, and I was just taken aback, I did not expect this. And I realized being a conservative in Washington DC, you're still a minority, you're still uh, someone kind of pushed to the side, but that's kind of like being a Jew or a Christian in a Muslim country. Um, you, there's rules of engagement with you. You're kind of a protected glass because you're part of the game. You're part of the, the, the fabric of what the city exists and to And there do. are synagogues and Christian churches in Muslim countries. Yes, yeah. To go to. Iran, you, Iran have, Christians have special rights. There are institutions and organizations and groups yes. for you if you're a member of totally. those minority groups, unlike a conservative in San yeah, Francisco. In San Francisco, you're a pagan in a Muslim <laughs> yeah. country. Yeah. You exist to be destroyed. There's no rules protecting you. Not only are you a pagan, you're the only pagan. Yes. <laughs> you <laughs> and me. <laughs> yeah, there's not many pagans around here. So, uh, yeah. It's uh, you got to choose your relationships pretty carefully, but uh, you know once you find them, I think people are uh, as that as that seems to be, they're pretty <laughs> they're pretty relieved to find you, and so yeah. I think that creates some good bonds between people, like minded people. Yeah, um, I just don't talk politics generally. Yeah, that's, with, that's the easiest way to do it with intimate relations. You know, yeah. in anyone I care about personally, that's always been my rule, and it just never goes well, and it ends relationships that are more important to me yeah. uh, for non political reasons. But so, are you still with that girlfriend? Nope. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got shouted down by some lesbians in a restaurant. That sounds yep. right to me. Yeah. For questioning what the wage gap or something i don't know i don't even remember it was, I was just like yeah, i don't know or was it that you were just beating her up is that no i wasn't doing that either <laughs> violence or uh, words are violence robert it's true okay 
So you founded your background. You just called yourself a conservative. Yeah. You just called yourself a Catholic. Yep. Right. Um, and you said you were born. You're from the East Bay Bay Area originally. Yeah, I was. I was born Lafayette, which is in the East Bay. Uh, it was very elementary school. Then we moved to the DC area after that. Um, I went to school at UVA, uh, and then after I graduated, I lived in Washington D.C. and just did you know nonprofit work and then journalism work. Okay, but you said again before we started rolling, you told me that your family was sort of liberal Catholics. Oh, sure, yeah. And you became an atheist or atheistic? I, I just like whatever teenagers do. You know, I, I, I became like, yeah, God, this is all nonsense. Uh -huh. God doesn't exist and whatnot. Um, but then you came back. Yeah, I came back. That's I, unusual. Um, the U turn. Largely was because, uh, uh, you know, around 20 or something, I, I met a smart group of people in college on campus. This is actually when I was at University of Mary Washington who were Catholics. Hmm. Um, and I realized like, this isn't just like dumb knuckle draggers believing in fairy tales. Like there's a lot more to it than that. Well, um, tell me. Uh, I uh, mean, <laughs> they're like. I guess the 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 bottom line of it is that you know, the the things like positivism and utilitarianism uh, that we take as obvious and neutral and natural Ooh. are simply part of. Yeah. A modern zeitgeist or yeah. zeitgeist, I guess it's pronounced uh -huh. zeitgeist. Uh -huh. I'm not good at German. Um, and like those things aren't like pre-rationally correct. Uh -huh. uh, they they build an own their own system of rationality that you draw conclusions from that might seem obvious if you're embedded in them. Uh -huh. um, you know, actually, I'm I'm not super. In, I'm not super versed in theology. Certainly less so than I am political theory. Uh, and my stance on that is like. If the average Catholic can't understand it, like, you don't need it. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, it might be an, an interesting intellectual exercise. It might be good, but I think, like, the super academic theology, as you, as you ratchet up the sophistication, it's it, something it, you don't need. It's fascinating. Oh, so, okay. So you came back to not only Catholicism, but you came back as a conservative or traditionalist yeah, uh, Catholic. When, when I came to Catholicism, I was probably still some kind of liberal, libertarian, something along those lines, mm -hmm. being like, well, you know, just don't hurt other people. And like, then, then you don't have to think about anything anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple and neat for someone who's like 20 or 19. Um, yeah, I, I just think as I, I actually came to DC in kind of a libertarian nonprofit circle, mm -hmm. which was a great place, a great place to learn stuff, to meet people. Um, and that forced me to think about it pretty much every day because it was my job. And it kind of dawned on me. It's like maybe we should have some kind of social mediation of you know, our lives as, uh, as interpersonal animals that isn't simply we made a contract. There might be more to it than that. And social mediation come, sometimes comes in the form of state intervention, something like that. And so this made me more conservative uh, and a conservative that welcomed the realignment that came with 2016 mm -hmm. away from this microwave Reaganism of all that conservatives is about is lowering taxes and cutting regulation and preventing plastic straws from being banned, you know? So microwave Reaganism, meaning warmed over yeah. 1980s conservatism. It's, yeah, it's, and that's basically just right neoliberalism. It's okay. like free trade, good no matter what. Right. Uh, low taxes, that's the only reason we're doing this we just need to lower taxes for the rich and yeah. it's like do we something i mean it's probably like the, there's economic efficiency arguments for it the story doesn't end there though right so and you said a couple of things about in passing there that sounded like critiques of the dominant culture or regime i suppose uh, utilitarianism and what was the other one was it rationalism uh, positivism positivism yeah yes, which, which i mean these things are all similar you know? yeah i mean positivism is like uh, rationalism on steroids Sure, yeah, it's the only uh, authoritative sources of knowledge are uh, experience and deduction. Mm -hmm. you know? So rationalism in the old sense would be Descartes, uh, it's like, who actually didn't, this is simplifying, it didn't exactly believe in the authority of experience because it, be, it could all be lies. Right. It could, you could be a demon, it could be in a dream. Uh -huh. So your sensory information could all be wrong. So uh -huh. he believed in pure, pure deduction, mm -hmm. pure reason. Um, and that's where I think therefore I am comes from because mm -hmm. logically to be logically consistent 
if you're thinking, you are something. Something's doing the thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know the empiricists, you have people like Hume, who kind of were the whole the whole other side of that. It's like I can only know things exist if I'm like getting current sensory information of them. Yeah. Uh, and then positivism is kind of the synthesis of these two, um, and that's positivism proper as like you know the 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 hard and pure stuff has kind of fallen out of favor since the beginning of the 20th century. But like the, the impression of it is still here. It's like, it, well, okay, do you have evidence? Did you prove that mathematically? You know? Right. If you, if you, if you can't count it or measure it, yeah. it's probably not important. Sure. Is that right? Yeah. That's how I read positivism. That's, that's, that's perfect. That's good. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my profession. Historians generally operate that way. If you don't have that kind of evidence in your argument, it will be deemed a failure. And what you're saying is that there's more to the world, to life, and to politics than that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't define myself in opposition to positivism or rationalism or anything like this. I, it's like, those are like, planes fly, math works. Yeah, they're useful. Yeah. Within, like, within particular contexts. Sure. Is that right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I think that the questions of man's place in the universe, and maybe if there's a world of metaphysical facts, mm -hmm. moral facts, mm -hmm. These things, positivism, maybe either is not equipped to answer, or we need to throw out positivism to engage with those questions. Yeah, and so that makes you into it's a it's a particular political orbit, I guess, that includes people called paleoconservatives, sure. okay, uh, and traditionalist Catholics, yep. various kinds, um, some what I would call right wing or conservative libertarians, mm -hmm. I think, also. Jordan Peterson also he's a, he reject I mean not he doesn't do it well but he rejects positivism at least to some extent he he talks about he's he's unsatisfied with it right he talks about how there are things outside yeah. of rationality I, that are important right I th I think, like the archetypes that apparently like flow through history yeah, his, his, over his, millennia those are outside of the rational mind right I don't know his Jungianism I don't know I think it's kind of goofy sure uh, I don't know but Ann Peterson I think I like him as a Self-help guru. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure he's helped hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, maybe at least tens of thousands. To clean the room. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's important. I'm all like, for it. Become, uh, become an adult. Become a man. Please. These are great. This is something like we need in this kind of uh, society where patriarchy has been dissolved, at least a little bit. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I've described Peterson as a demoralized liberal. Mm. He's a liberal, he, and he believes in kind of the liberal mythologies of the Enlightenment and of liberal democracy. Okay. He believes in these things, but he's demoralized by, I think, what those things produce. Yeah, I was going to say, so you, you used another word, enlightenment, right? So yeah. I think that's why I'm attracted to your way of thinking, which is that on, a, on one level, what you guys are doing at Jacobite is yeah. launching a sustained critique of the enlightenment, sure. or you're rejecting it, yeah. basically. And so that's what, what's fascinating is that brings together some very unlikely bedfellows, does. doesn't it? So It's super fun, that this right? kind of motley crew that it brings together. So it brings together someone like, you know, a, a conservative Catholic like you. I'm not sure exactly how conservative you are, but we'll find out. Brings with me, because we share this, everything you said just now, I agree with 100%, yeah. you know, and people know that I am not <laughs> a traditional Catholic, traditionalist Catholic, or a conservative really in any way, I don't think. Um, it brings together uh, people like I think Jordan Peterson and maybe Ben Shapiro, who has talked about this, right? Because he's re religious people. Sure. It brings together conservative religious people with people with wackadoodles like me mm -hmm. and certain elements of the left as well who are very critical of the Enlightenment, yep. too. Like, I, unfortunately, identity politics is very much a rejection of Enlightenment thinking as well, isn't it? Sure. I mean, uh, it's a, I, it's a problem for us. Yeah. Because we don't I, want them as bedfellows. Well, to be clear, I'm, I'm more or less or maybe, position myself against the Enlightenment. Yeah. Um, I know. Okay, too. great. I just, yeah, yeah. just want to make that sure. I'm saying we're, we're on the same team okay, cool. against yeah, yeah. the Enlightenment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're losing, unfortunately. I think that's true. Well, I don't know, actually. We might. I mean, there's, there is currently a realignment happening that could go in a lot of directions. Yeah. Uh, there's a turn happening. Yeah. I, I, maybe. I, I, like that, uh, I like that phraseology right there, turn. Yeah. Um, I hope. Because I, I think, you know, we we can get into that later. I think you'll you'll probably bring up that question, but planes will continue to fly, yeah. everyone. Once we once we fully critique and reveal the enlightenment <laughs> for the totalitarian nightmare that it's been, you can still take airplanes. I promise you, right? It'll be pretty sweet. Yeah, right. maybe even better airplanes. Maybe yeah. maybe they'll have more legroom. I think so. I think so. 
So, but that is, I'm right, that that is large, or in large part what Jacobite's up to and what your politics is about, right? It's, it's a rejection of the Enlightenment. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, that's 85% correct. Okay. And that's not a failure of yours. It's a mm-hmm. failure of, I think, uh, if we're doing anything coherent that it hasn't really coalesced yet into mm-hmm. anything that terminology mm-hmm. is good at, uh, good at characterizing. Um, you know, I, I think what a big part of what we're about, you know, exit was one of them. Um, that doesn't mean we're, we're totally fanatics for exit. I think exit is just undervalued. Can you, yeah, flesh that out a bit. You have a mission statement in which you talk about sure. exit being what you guys are about. What does it, what does exit as a politics mean to you? Uh, it could mean a lot. It could mean a lot of things. And that's, I think why it's interesting. It could be, you know, like, uh, if some of your, some of your listeners might be familiar with Rod Dreher. He's mm-hmm. a big blogger at the American conservative. I disagree with him on a lot of things, uh, but his idea of rather than trying to fight what seems to be a losing battle for uh, traditional religious communities against this society that frankly hates them increasingly, um, which is, by the way, why evangelicals support Trump. Like, it's, this, hmm. this, this mystified every like, liberal Vox type. It's like, no, evangelicals support Trump. You know, he's like a lecherous, cheating, gross weirdo. Who likes gays. Right, exactly. Like, okay, th- there's a really easy answer to this. It's because his opposition is trying to destroy evangelicals. Mm-hmm. They view them as kulaks that need to be uprooted. True. Um, but so he's the he's this weak reed they're they're latching on to right. like, yeah, in, this, in, in a rising ocean. Maybe this will do it. Like <laughs> like this is all we got. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, to which I say tough shit. But anyway, continue. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, the Dreyer thing is like okay, so may, maybe us winning. So us dying is not an option. We don't want to do that. Hmm. Us changing the world probably isn't an option. That's a big task. So let's build a parallel society, just like kind of how. I think a good example is how Orthodox Jews do it. They yeah. live in Manhattan totally. and they have a parallel society with their own, you know, schools, their own businesses, and they do great. They're as far as I can tell. Orthodox Jews have the highest fertility rate. They're, they're growing the fastest of any Jewish. I have often, believe it or not, envied them when yeah. I walk past to see them. They have jobs. They have wives. They're taken care of. They have a community. They will never have to worry, as far as I can tell, about you know being taken care of uh, materially. And socially, yeah. they have a they have a they have a group. They belong. Sure, you know the rest of us are just like spinning around in ennui in this in this. Yeah, they have, they have postmodern social, age. <laughs> they have great social technology. They, yeah, uh, you know, and so yeah, another thing might be, and this is kind of a dated example because I'll get into it, but you know you can't really do this anymore. Uber just saying like uh, taxi cartels are bad. Um, we're not like fixing them through like appealing to the mayor. It would probably take forty years. Mm-hmm. It's just like that build be, an app. Right, that would be voice. That would sure. be the yeah, voice. That'd be voice. That's that'd voice. Be voice. Uh, building an app is like all right. Uh, middle finger to the law. We're just going to let people take rides that are like better. Yep. Uh, that would be exit. Yeah, and so they did that. Yeah, um, totally. You know, the, first, the early part of the 2010s, you could really do that as a tech company. Up until 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, they no one had really done it before. They had just kind of outran regulators, uh, and because the, the regular these are new technologies. They didn't they didn't fit into any box for regulation, um, and so the regulation was written after the fact. After they were already kind of won, they won the court of public opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be a really pure example of just like in, uh, something that might appeal to libertarians very much. Sure. A type of economic exit. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, an interesting little point about this: so you can't you can't really do that anymore. Like the wild west days of that is over. Really. Uh, yeah, like businesses can't just ignore the law. Like tech startups can't just ignore the law like they used to, uh, or at least they aren't doing that, and yeah. they probably aren't doing that for a reason. Right. Um, but, uh, and I think that that brings us to hmm. something that uh, I guess I didn't realize that. Sorry, I didn't realize that Uber that was their business model. They just ignored. Yeah, they the basically law? broke. They, they, they even broke had, the law. Yeah, they even had a system like if, if they the algorithm determined. Or whoever determined someone was like probably a regulator or like someone trying to snoop on them, see if they were doing it wrong. It would tag them and like prevent them from getting rides. There's really? a New Times piece on this. Yeah, I did not know this. Yeah, so they kind of straightforwardly and intentionally broke the law. I feel better about them now. Yeah, okay. um, but you know, like, th- I, so that's I, a form of sorry, I, but that's a form of exit that's not exactly what you guys are about. I mean, we're sympathetic to it. Like, okay. you know, uh, we were like, if that's what needs to be done. So I, I think the purest explanation of the kind of, 
I would say exit is like a little piece of a bigger thing that we're about. And that's looking back to the impersonal forces of history as driving things rather than as these deliberative institutional bodies. Like, I think it's easy and naive to think that, okay, the European Union passing this law, it's, this is how we're going to change and write history. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's wrong for a number of reasons. Like, obviously, policy uh, has massive impacts, but um, the idea that these institutional mechanisms, these, these mechanisms are power themselves, I think is wrong. Um, and an example I, I sometimes point to is, you know, the difference between a feudal system and a liberal republican system is that power is, finger quotes, rationalized, and that it is distributed by merit and by like, uh, office with discrete and defined powers and so on and so forth, and they can engage with these people with these rules, there's anti-corrupt, you can't be friends with this person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, obviously that works to a large extent, but below it, I think, is the reality of power, which something like feudalism, and I'm not endorsing, I don't think we should go to the feudal system here, feudalism is very clear about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, feudalism says, if you're friends with a king, you got power. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's always been how it was, and that's always how it will be. Like Loretta Lynch, uh, during the 2016 election, myster- was mysteriously very close friends with the Clintons, mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, even, you know, against probably like a... The Attorney General. Yeah. Uh, under L- under L- Obama. L- Loretta, uh, Obama's the attorney, L- uh, right. uh, attorney General Loretta Lynch. Um, right. Yeah. So she didn't uh, have any inquiries or certainly not charges against Clinton, even though there's some pretty damning stuff. Uh, and that's kind of the old, true power relation hmm. coming to the surface, even though we obscure it with these supposed supposedly rational mechanisms of liberal democracy. Okay. Um, so that's one example of like, the impersonal forces of history is how people behave with their friends. Another one might be technology, like Uber. What happens when everyone has a smartphone and everyone has data and you have really good positioning and GPS uh, systems? Well, something happens and it was not deliberated. It was not discussed. Like, you know, how, like, uh, certainly like, Mm. left-wing radical types are like this needs to be deliberate this was never deliberated okay it's like yeah of course it wasn't fucking deliberated so in that, are you saying in that sense it's non-rational um it's not rationalized yeah i yeah. don't know i mean th- uh, rational is such a messy word that i regret using it now uh well rationalized that's right yeah it's like it's, it's attempt not... attempt to make an intelligible system out of yeah like pure relationships between people that's not intelligible at all it's like opaque and weird exactly even though maybe it has rational outcomes to respect it. Right. So, uh, yeah. How would a pure social scientist, a positivist, evaluate this conversation? Right? Uh, I mean, positivism is just epistemology. They can't, is my point. Uh, I mean, they could count count the number of words we speak. hmm. I'm not sure I'd go this far on trying to drag positivism. I mean, positivism (laughs) is simply how do we know things? And I think a a positivist could arrive at the same conclusions we do. But I think, not, maybe not the same conclusions, the same analysis we have. The, where I break with a positivist when it comes to um, like po- political prescriptions, like what we should do, because yeah, positivists can be like, yeah, that's totally right, uh, Thad and Rob. Like, yeah, mechanisms of liberal democracy often obscure the real relations. I think a positivist could totally come to that conclusion. But, okay, what should we do is the question that I think a positivist, that's a question of ethics. Mm-hmm. And I think positivists are just become goofy there. Well, it's a question of values. Sure. What do you want? Yeah, and, and various people might want different things, but I think that's, then you're descending into relativism, which is descending into nihilism. Yeah. Um, which is so I think yeah. this is, like, you need <laughs> to ask questions of political theology. How does the metaphysical, and you know, the, the, the world of moral facts, or the, the world of should, uh, and dare I say the supernatural, how does this, uh, how, what can we infer from this in terms of how we should organize our society? Right. What should we do? Right. What are people for? Right. And th- I think the people we should be dragging here is the utilitarians, because they're unable to ask these questions. Hmm. Um, how so? so uh, are you talking about Jeremy Bentham, the original utilitarians, or just uh, how? I mean, I've read the more contemporary utilitarians, like Singer, Peter Singer, okay. um, but I haven't read Bentham, but I mean, you know, it's, I, th- I, I think the appeal of utilitarianism is that is 
eminently intelligible. It's so clear. It's like, whoa, if that makes you happy, you know, it's like, if that feels good for people, that's all it's all about. Um, but I think asking questions of the metaphysical is kind of a, like an orbital laser to that. It's like, okay, maybe people should do things that aren't necessarily what make them feel good or feel happy. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think what's interesting is hmm. we were talking about a, a kind of a motley crew of people who fall into this demoralized category of, of these ideas that have been ruling us for maybe a century include some of Marxist theoreticians. Like, I'd say more so than Marx itself or himself, uh, these the theoreticians that uh, were his students are trying to, they wouldn't admit it, but they're trying to rediscover virtue, virtue in the sense of like, what should you do? What is morally excellent for you yeah. rather than yeah. what is what you want? Right. Um, Cause you know, Marx framed it in terms of like human flourishing. Al Marxist alienation right. is, de is described as uh, separating people from their true nature separating people from, he didn't say what they should do, but that's more or less the, the, the bottom line. Um, okay, so here's what I do with people uh, yeah. whose politics are different than mine, which means everybody. <laughs> uh, it's, the, uh, it's the barricades test. Oh, so okay. I'm quite sure that the first barricade will be on the same side of you and I, that we're gonna be fighting against the positivists, the progressives, the do-gooders, the people who claim to know what you and I should want and should do based on science and their own rationality and their own code of ethics. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be, hand me, hand me the biggest gun you can find, okay. Rob, and we'll be there together. Um, once we win that, once we stave off that revolution, once we defeat that revolution, I, and, and you guys take over, or there's more of you than anyone else, yeah. uh, what are you going to tell me about what I should want, like my values? So my thing is, I've always said to people, the first political, when you start being political, the first and the, the most, to me, the most important question you should ask is, what do you value? What do you sure. want? And then it's just a question of strategy, okay. right? Just a yeah, question of, of how to get it. It's like, yeah, okay. what's instrumental to that? But for me, yeah, what's instrumental about it? But to me, the choice of the value should be left autonomous, or at least I try to do that. I don't okay. want to make even a moral claim about that, but I just, my politics tells me to leave people alone okay. when they are deciding what they value. Uh, we, you and I agree that the people you're calling utilitarians and positivists, what I would call progressives, you might call them that too, Marxists yeah, to some extent, sure, you know, sort of the left liberal dominant regime out there, you know, they know exactly what we should want, what we should do, we, we agree on that, but your sounds like you believe in virtue, moral good, outside of human consciousness, right? Sure, you must, absolutely. because you're a. Catholic. I believe in other things. That's one of them. Absolutely. So now, what does that mean in practical terms after the after the first revolution is defeated and you guys take over and and much of the world is a Christian, Catholic, conservative, Mariani uh, regime? What specific policies are enacted? Yeah. Like what do I need to get? Abortions a... banned. Oh, really? Porn is banned by by the state. Yep. Okay. Right. Um, oh, so I will be getting a bigger gun. Yeah, an even gotta, bigger. We got to get a got to get a big gun. We're gonna have you. to go automatic, full full automatic <laughs> for you. Sorry. If I get it, I might get a, need to get a stinger missile. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, um, and oh, more less concretely, huh. things are viewed as not what will maximize GDP, um, but what will help facilitate people leading good lives. What will maximize virtue. Sure. Is that right? Yeah. Maximization is a weird word to use with virtue. <laughs> it so sure a is. A little mechanistic. <laughs> but funny. sure, yeah. Can I just say, I won't say which company you work for, but you also work for a, a significant tech startup yeah. in San Francisco. So, a, that's how I make my money. Yeah, it's sort of funny that you're using, you know, very tech, high-tech words, oh, but... Yeah. I'm, I'm all about I'm about all about like measuring what should be measured and like maximizing what should be maximized. I, I respect capitalism as a, a Scott Alexander, the, a blogger, put it as like a demon summoned from the void. Yeah, what's the name? Uh, uh, Star, Star Slate Star Codex. Slate Star Codex. Yeah, I think it's a very elegant way to put that. Brilliant blogger. Yeah. Um, and capitalism. I was talking about impersonal forces of history before. Capitalism is absolutely one of them. It is a 
giant collective brain. Mm -hmm. Um, Hmm. That doesn't mean that we should just do whatever the market says. Like we should find out, okay, we have this massively powerful, almost force of nature, like force of human consciousness that is, it's not going anywhere. So what the market? Yeah, sure. It could. Capitalism. It's been, it's been squashed, contained, closeted, constrained. Then like everyone who does that fails. Like there's a Darwinian selection aspect to like Venezuela is not going to be exporting their shit anywhere. So far. Um, Yes. History so far is on your side. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident about the, the security of capitalism. And so then once we, okay, this thing that like actually creates abundance uh, we got that. It's not going anywhere. Then you ask, okay, so does this make people do what they're supposed to be doing um, or what is good for them? Um, and in some cases it does. Like, you know, there's the ancient conceptions of freedom uh, are include autonomy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ones that like G.K. Chesterton pointed to, mm-hmm. uh, the great Catholic thinker, one of the mm-hmm. first ones I, I read. Um I've been watching Father Brown. Oh yeah, on BBC. Yeah, I've never, I've never it's, seen it. It's a, it's like the second or third most popular BBC series I think of all really? time. It's I a gotta Chester- watch it. Is it good? Yeah, I know no, it's, okay, it's, it's, it's not bad. good. Um, okay. But <laughs> it's, but it's interesting. It's about a Catholic priest who solves murders yeah, in this yeah. little in this little village in England, and it's funny. It's like the village has like three hundred people in it, but there's like a murder every day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I, that's so Chesterton. But it's it's interesting because it's it's a very idyllic, obviously sort sure. of uh, place out of time. It's a classic sort of conservative utopian vision, sure. except for the, all the murder that goes on. Right. But there's this beautiful patriarch in the middle of it who solves everybody's problems, not just the murders. Right. So there's also this clear hierarchy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. The priest Hi- hierarchy in service of the common good. Yeah. Is a kind of classical conservative idea rather than hierarchy for the sake of a hierarchy. But you said there's autonomy in that system of thought. Sure. First, I, individual I, autonomy. I mean, uh, maybe autonomy is a weird word, but like. Yeah, there's more. There was more autonomy living in the English countryside than I would say there is uh, in San Francisco. Yes, in living in San Francisco in like a pod or whatever. How? Because you're able to able to have a garden. You're able to. Uh-huh. You're, it depends how you define autonomy. Really, yeah. Autonomy literally being able to satisfy uh, urges with an app. No way. Not even close. Autonomy being able to like facilitate. Uh, a good life for yourself mm. outside of n- not even not even mediated by your neighbors mm. um, but probably including them I would say is, would be a lot easier mm. now, and, and I would like to note because you know I'm we're having a very conversational podcast here so I'm kind of thinking out loud yeah I'm uh, this is good you know, I'm not saying we should go back to that I'm saying this is something to consider that we can we can pick and repurpose from the past and when the cycle of history turns again that's something in our toolbox I'm thinking out loud too. Okay. So here's what I like. And maybe I'm wrong though. It seems to me you are a fascinating blend of pre modern and post modern thinking. Sure. That's, Does that make sense to that you? That sounds like I, I've never thought about it that way. That sounds an elegant way to describe me. So the pre modern, we've actually pretty, we've laid out pretty well so far, which is that you are rejecting or at least a harsh critic of the Enlightenment, rationalism, utilitarianism the reduction of the human experience to numbers, to quantification, sure. to counting, right? I'm totally with you, by the way, on that stuff. And also you are, you have a fondness for hierarchy, for traditional hierarchies in which it's clear who's who and what's what and who has the power and who has less power and, right? And yeah. what your function is and role is in society. That's all pre-modern, mm-hmm. right? And, and it's fixed, at least, at least... Well, it's not fixed totally. Like the, the, I'm sure you would agree with Burke that change should come gradually and organically, not, not be denied. Certainly the organically part. Maybe sometimes cataclysmically I'm not against. Okay. Uh, yeah. But not, not by sort of executive fiat sure. by one right. thinker who, who decrees for the entire world that yeah. we should have X law right? right, or X way of thinking. Okay, so that's the pre-modern part. The postmodern part, maybe I don't know. When you start when you start talking about autonomy in pre-modern regimes, like a like a little Catholic squire, little hobbit, little yeah, right. Um, I was thinking of Foucault and his idea of people who live in the shade in the pre-modern regimes because his his thing he sort of tosses it off. He doesn't really develop this, but I'll do it for him. Mm. <laughs> I'll read between the lines for him. I always read it as me, him meaning. 
people under feudalism, people under monarchs, even slaves under slaveholders, had something that looked more like freedom, actually, or maybe autonomy because of the hierarchy, because they were kept out of decision-making, sure. management, governance, the state, response, social responsibility, right? They weren't even allowed often to have families or to be the heads of families in many ways, right? So they, they had no power, they couldn't seek power, and therefore they were left to their own devices largely. And that, to me, and Foucault suggests, and I think he's right, that there is some kind of freedom, clearly not legal, not formal freedom, mm -hmm. but there's some kind of maybe psychological freedom, a personal freedom there, because you're not worried about the government. It's a, not a sure. democracy. Yes. Mass politics like introduced a bunch of like there you go. psychosocial anxieties on people. Yeah. We These people think we need to think about like Trump all the time. It's like even okay, even if you hate him, you're just anxious about one more thing now. Yeah. Uh, and so like, the idea of of politics as this like participatory s spiritual thing uh, is certainly something I'm against. Um, <laughs> I've never read Foucault, but I mean that that sounds pretty spot on. Huh. Um, Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, 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 this brings me to another point. You said like you know the idea of decision making like. I think one of the problems of having a liberal philosophical underpinning, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not against strictly against liberalism. It's about a lot of good stuff, like you know, like markets work pretty well. When you say you're talking about classical liberalism, you're talking about yeah, I mean, 19th century free market. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not an adherent of classical liberalism either. I think they got a lot of things wrong too. But you're not talking about Franklin Roosevelt liberalism. Oh, sure. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. You like um, you like class. You like elements of class. Though I mean, hey, I'm not against. Uh, I'm, if if the New Deal weren't done wrong, I'm not against the idea of social mediation of you know, the economics of a society. You, like maybe, maybe socialized healthcare is what we need. I don't know. Well, you want a government to ban abortion. First sure. Of all. So yeah. You, we know this about you already. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think this idea, when, when, when you, when you take <laughs> metaphysics out of, you take political theology, I'll say like, what is, how should we be arranged based on something metaphysical? You get these really weird moral axioms that I think are wrong and kind of maybe even self-contradictory mm -hmm. like you have autonomy or not not autonomy, excuse me um you have like a non-aggression principle and like consent and contract so the non-aggression principle is sort of the bedrock of much of libertarian thought which is that you are not allowed morally to aggress against another right and that's and, what they build everything out of which is why i think yeah. libertarianism is an att attractive ideology to a lot of people because it's so obvious mm -hmm. it's like oh well all we have to do is say don't hurt other people and don't and steal their stuff everything else falls into place out of that right mm -hmm. and you know i think that's wrong and naive and frankly bad um mm -hmm. but that's that's more or less with a little bit of fdr type uh putting your fingers on the scales every now and then that's kind of what we have today as mm -hmm. as our underpinning um and there's a lot of baggage with that like the, the consent obviously you shouldn't like sexually assault people that's wrong but the idea that like someone's choice uh is this transcendent and inviolable thing mm -hmm. is just obviously ridiculous a person in this atomic moment yeah. a person is produced by an array of external factors the human is not an island like they're produced by their previous decisions they're produced by their social relationships they're produced by their economic situation uh they're 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 produced by uh, you know the, the climate uh god you know what you sound like now a marxist an, an intersectionalist i mean look i the marxists aren't wrong about everything well like, this is this is not marxism marxist marxist hate inter no, no. intersectionalism but you're you're that's an intersectionalist argument you just made that we are our identities are multifaceted i mean i think that's obvious that our identities are multifaceted and we have multiple identities uh, I don't know if Simultaneously. I'm saying that. I mean, I, yeah, I think well, the you idea, do. The, uh, maybe one postmodern thing about me is that I don't know. Like the idea of identity, I think, is well, you're many a fiction. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Like, I think the idea of you know the self is a fiction. Like maybe you have a fractal self. I don't know. But I mean, certainly the idea that your choice, like we are all transcendent decision makers, removed from matter and society that can just make the choice is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Our choices are socially produced mm -hmm. and therefore consent is socially produced. Right. So I, I need to go back to how big my gun needs to be. So <laughs> when I said, when you guys take over, uh, that was a dumb question. I, I, I guess what I should have asked is, 
do you want to take over? And if so, what do you want to take over? I mean, I don't think I'm the guy that should be in charge. But I think, <laughs> like you know, so I believe in a, I believe in an elite. Okay. Uh, yeah. I believe, of course. I don't believe in our elite. I think our elite sucks. Like what follows from I think saying we should have an elite. It's like okay, also our elite needs to be virtuous. Mm-hmm. I think one problem is like I'm not against meritocracy, but like we we've gone. We used to have some kind of Thing approximating aristocracy in this country, and those aristocrats were known as the Wasps, mm-hmm. and they, they were known were, as the Roosevelts. Sure, <laughs> they were very insular kinds of people. It's like marriage mattered, just like it mattered to mm-hmm. literal aristocrats. It mattered like breeding, and you spent your whole life kind of preparing to give light and guidance to everyone else, or at yep. least that's the story you told yourself. Absolutely. Um, and those were replaced by a multicolor meritocracy, and that's obviously good in some ways I think the story is that it was an unmitigated good and that's a story I don't believe Mm -hmm. um, because now you have people who well the wasps view themselves they're pretty self-conscious about it we're a different class of people the rest are not our sort and from this distinction becomes comes well there's attendant responsibilities and obligations upon that it's like well if we're separate we must be separate for a reason that reason, I guess, I guess we owe these people direction. Noblesse oblige. Yeah. Right? That's what you're talking but, about? Yeah. Yep. The uh, obligation of the rich to help the poor. Totally. Or maybe not even the rich, just the people who the upper... are bred to be able to guide things and direct things. Okay. Yeah. Um, but now you have a meritocracy. This is a great city to be in to experience it. Uh, when you say it's a meritocracy... You don't really mean that. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, it's maybe theoretically. I, I, I believe it to a certain extent. It's I mean, like people, like, look, people from South Bend, Indiana can come here and be millionaires. Sure. Uh, because they're good at stuff. Right. I'm, I'm thinking about San Francisco and how rigged everything oh, yeah. is in I mean, so many ways. But, you know, it's like a, lo- a lot of the wealth here is like, look, you got lucky because you knew JavaScript at age 14. So now yeah. you make. Well, there's all these rules. 300 total. Comments. But now here in this crazy city, there's all these social justice rules. Which, oh, yeah. Which, oh, e- which, course, even these, course. which even these billionaire tech moguls abide by. It's, re- it's amazing. Yeah, they're I mean, they're scared. They're scared of it. They're scared of being called out. I mean, no. I mean, and I think there's a really obvious reason for that. And it's a similar one to I described before. It's like there, there always needs to be a, a legitimation of the people on top. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the WASPs, it was like, well, we, we bring light and guidance. Or I mean, that, that's, maybe that's not the WASP, but that's the general aristocratic mm-hmm. explanation. It's like, that's why we get to be on top. Uh, and that sanitizes their power. The king said, I, am, I serve God, and by serving God, I serve everyone. That's why I get to have power. Um, and what billionaires, the Salesforce guy, whatever his name is, uh, do you know his name? Oh, right. He's the most hated man in this town. <laughs> the head of Salesforce. I forget his name. Yeah, Every, everybody I, I know hates him. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and he's super, like, progressive. He's super, super social justice. And right. he, do, he doesn't, it's pretty obvious that, like, he does this in the same way everyone else does it or at least everyone else approximating his wealth does it because it sanitizes their power it's like wait why do you get to have 10 billion dollars why is that okay it's like oh because i'm down with the whatever transgender politics or like you know because we have look we have this picture of a woman in a hijab she's coding like, and we have an all, <laughs> all gender bathroom exactly right et cetera. so okay. it's like yeah it's, it's just it, it it shores up legitimacy for them right um and Huh. That legitimacy, I think, sucks compared to like, wait, we have real obligations. Uh, the merit, because meritocrats, I think, largely view themselves as middle class still, mm-hmm. even though they make six hundred whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, if you're just middle class, so you don't have any separate class duties. Uh, you simply are a middle class person with unlimited resources. Sounds pretty good. You have all all the all the all the gravy, but no other, none of the responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think this has created a shitty elite who don't really care about much except their own whims. Um, hmm. it, and I think a, a nice distinction, a nice example to, to draw the distinction is between the elites, the wealthy elites of New York and the wealthy elites of San Francisco. Uh, the wealthy elites of New York, there's like society gatherings that happen with them. Mm-hmm. And what comes out of most of those, and obviously it's for status they do this, but who cares? Well, one thing that came out of them was Donald Trump. Uh, yes. That was a mistake, though. DJT. That was a mistake. Uh, debatable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they give hundreds of millions of dollars to like 
civic institutions of New York City. Yep. That makes New York like a really vibrant place. That's right. The, like the Metropolitan yeah, Museum absolutely. of Art. That's the American, taken billions of dollars to survive. American Museum of Natural History, the opera, the ballet, yeah. all the museums, so like, galleries. New York is like yep. a real cultural powerhouse. San Francisco is not. Right. And even outside of culture, it's like, it's clearly missing a social fabric here because VCs are just people who view themselves as absolutely atomized creatures or not the v, I'm shitting on VCs, but that's like an example of like a Bay area rich venture person. capitalists for yeah. those weird people who don't live here. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like they view themselves like, Oh, I'm just going to help the world with my latest. It's like, no, you're going to, you're going to take a nice, nice return on investment from, I don't agree with you Okay. Uh, about these people. I don't like them, but I think you're wrong. I, you don't think they're true believers at all in what they're doing? I mean... You think they're purely cynical? I don't I don't think anyone's Hom- purely cynical. Homo economicus? That's what no they are? No one's purely cynical. Okay. Um, but people can mind kill themselves into aligning their values with what would otherwise be their self-interest. Okay. Just like the rich people in New York. It's like, no, I really care about the arts. Like, you want to brag to your friends and get your name on something. Like, these things, these are competing for... Some people truly do believe things. I, I don't believe... I don't believe in the, the purely cynical view of any human behavior. Like some people really want to become monks, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I think one is better than other. There's a better social technology in, among the more aristocratic New York elites than there mm-hmm. is among these Patagonia wearing goblins. Mm-hmm. I okay, I hear you. I pretty much despise the new culture of San Francisco that was brought here by tech. However, I believe that the production. Uh, their production has been a massive social good. Unmi- I mean, just historic. It's, oh yeah, un- I'm not saying so. I love tech. Yeah, so you work in tech. Yeah, so but I'm, but I'm wondering what the problem is then. The problem is other than our neighborhoods the are boring. Isn't the social product okay. of like whatever this capital generates? The problem is the self perception of the elites that are a side effect of these great. Uh, inventions. Why are you so worried about the elites, though? I mean, there's always going to be an elite, and they're always going to be calling the shots, right? But it's if good the, to have good ones. But if the elites are are making Google happen, the greatest invention in human history by far, is it not? But th- that's an economic it, engagement. Then I'm happy with whatever they do. If, fine, if they keep their heads down. Let's like, someone has to run the show outside of just being like, "This is the next great product." I'm happy for these people to get rich. Don't get me wrong. Okay. It's like, if, if you're a brilliant engineer, hell yes, please become rich if you make my phone faster. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, once you become elite enough, you're not writing code. You have capital and you don't really have much to do. Mm-hmm. And then you, you have other stuff to occupy yourself with. That might be like oh, civil society. It's like, okay, what are we doing in my neighborhood? Um, or like, the, you know, like you said, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm-hmm. Um, or it might be like, okay, trying to set policy in government well do you decide what the code does sure oh yeah that, you, that's, you, that's another you decide how the code is deployed that's more than people in the middle which is kind of an interesting conversation like yeah, yeah. that that isn't the ceos huh. uh okay and so i think like this there's a very very warranted rancor against google for its it's capture of a lot of things that aren't like, like our search results. It's they probably ma- ma- manipulated search results. Like I forget what it was with Tulsi Gabbard, but it was pretty clear they spiked her. Hmm. Um, someone did that. Probably wasn't the CEO, or maybe it was just the algorithm itself working in a weird way. Wait, spiked negatively or yeah, positively? Negative. Negatively. Oh, sp- like in journalism, if you kill a story, right. you spike it. They dumped it. Yeah. 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 Um, Buried it. But you know, that's that's one of many examples of like. You know, leaving things to like these these companies uh, probably not a great idea. Well, that's because Google has a monopoly. That's the problem. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe, definitely, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, I don't know. All right, here's my but here's my concern. I have a couple concerns. So you didn't answer my question, which was Wait, like, sorry, I missed, it's I okay. It. What do you want to take over, if anything? Which where's your government that's going to be banning abortion? Which government is that? What will its jurisdiction be? Um, what are its borders? What, what territory hope, do you want? I mean, this. Where, I, I hope every. I hope there are many governments. Okay. I like this is, idea of secession is good. Exit again. You guys have on your website a statistic I have never even heard of. I hope it's correct. I'm a little skeptical of it, but I think it's probably gener- in principle right. 
you say in the website that in 1945 there were there were about 50 sovereign states in the world, and that now okay. there's about 200 sovereign states. I think it's more than that, but yeah, it's probably 220, something like that. So, but that's that's a great development yeah. as far as I'm concerned, because um, decentralization is it is for sure. me. That's really the way we save ourselves as a species, as a matter of fact. And you guys sound like you're into that too. Uh, I'm not decentraliz- pro decentralization for the sake of decentralization. Uh-huh. I'm for the sake that it will just lead to better things. I don't want Amazon like locking my smart refrigerator because I made an off color tweet or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's obviously an extreme example, a humorous example. But mm-hmm. uh, there was a story, something along these lines. Actually, it's escaping me. But it was like, <laughs> oh yeah, someone from like. The couldn't get medical care in the uh, National Health Service of the UK because they were like considered racist or something. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is probably not oh. good if someone could just determine right. that you can't be alive. Uh, so you want you want as many? Is this right? You want as many sovereign states as possible? Um, no, I wouldn't go that far. I would say or a lot. It's, if I had to, all other things equal, if I had to pick more, is probably better. It's like you know, it's like big countries don't serve everyone in a good way maybe they'd be better separate like you do you think your thing i do my thing yeah there's um, the there's the hayekian the friedrich hayek knowledge problem the larger the entity the less the people at the top know about sure, the entity or, or they just have less in comms they can't sure. agree anything this is very you know the people in washington can't possibly know what we're sure. doing in, yeah, in our I mean, neighborhood it's, it's more of a market argument but i i mean i i, I totally see what you're saying um well that's one argument sorry sure. and the other one the, the other one, one is just like yeah it's the, like, the one that i like more is and i think this is really in line with you guys um is the the more sovereign states we have out there the more places i have to exit to sure um yeah liberal archipelago is how some people describe i think it's a book actually that uses yeah. that turn of phrase but that's how some people describe it because i am quite sure my my very existence will be outlawed pretty soon in the yeah. bay area so I'm going to need multiple places to go to. Thank God we have a federal system. Yeah. We have different states. Nevada's not too far. So far. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not, like, decentralization does not solve everything, in my opinion. I would say it does not even solve most things. I'd say it's a good tool. Um, and by the way, the statistic, uh, the 1945 thing, I was made, that's possible because decolonization. Decolonization. Like, yeah, because oh, Africa was mostly the UK. That's right. And, like, that's right. France and stuff. Because all these new post-colonial yeah. nations um, emerged, right? Yeah, I mean, so that's uh, which is that, good, good you know, I, I would like to see the uh, United States government come this way. Um, I wouldn't advocate you mean for break apart. Oh no, no, no! no. Oh, I mean, mm, you mean I, you depends. Know. I mean, I was going back to your question about like banning abortion and porn and stuff. Gotcha. Like, yeah, I think. Oh, so the government you, should do that. You'd be cool with the current existing United States government totally banning abortion. Yes, and uh, this is actually an important point because. Uh, you know, so there's some leftist Catholics out there who actually respect. You just, you just said those words on Market Street in San Francisco. I just want to just put that out there. It's incredible. We're I mean, in a safe space. Not really. <laughs> I think we're in a we're in a space that's actually uh, occupied by a bunch of very lefty identity politics nonprofits, and we're using one of their office spaces for this. So yeah. it's like I told Rob, be quiet about the abortion thing <laughs> when you get here, buddy. <laughs> That's good, though. I like it. I love it. But and so a like, different idea. I think the general. Uh, I th- I think it's like wait. So you're saying you want this government to do it? I'm like, yeah, of course. This government isn't perfect, but like, it's don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. And you know, leftist Catholics who don't want to offend their secular friends. And you know, I have a great deal of respect for leftist Catholics. I think there's a great Catholic social justice tradition, mm-hmm. tradition different from, of course, the social justice warrior tradition. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's like uh, Liz Brunig. I don't want to call her out, but you know, she—I think she's she's great ideas. But like Elizabeth, so, sorry. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Brunig, Washington Brunig. Post columnist, um, husband of Matt Brunig. Or excuse me, her husband is Matt Brunig. Uh, Who's a, she's a he's bit, like, and he's like a lefty think tanker. Yeah, he's a he, he's he's a pretty smart guy. Um, you know, her, she has a lot of just conventional secular lefty followers who the idea of. So at least in the United States, the idea of... Is she, is she Catholic? Yeah, she's a pretty she's strong Catholic. Le, like a socialist Catholic. Yes. Yep. Um, and a socialist Catholic, there's nothing contradictory within that tradition. There's plenty of socialist Catholics out there um, about banning abortion. Um, but the argument, the argument that she makes to try to keep everyone happy 
is, well, I don't trust the carceral state of the United States. You know, I don't trust this government to do it. It's like, that's bullshit. Do you trust the carceral rape to handle rape? Of course you do. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you view abortion as something morally abhorrent, mm. then you cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's a cop out. Solid. Solid argument. Yeah. From you. And so, yeah, and to, to get back to your question, because I don't want to look like I'm dodging it again, I think every country should do this independently. Um, I think, just like I think every country should be Catholic. Because abortion is murder. Yes. To you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Sure. And if um, you, right. And I think it's any argument against, or any argument uh, permitting abortion that does not also permit the infanticide of like one month old babies is completely incoherent. Um, mm mm-hmm. Like the, the the birth count is not grant personhood. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, personhood is something intuited by us, and if there's a chance uh, that a human is being destroyed, then that's morally impermissible. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know. Who, maybe the answer is if you're not Catholic, then obviously the sole argument does not have much hold much water. But okay, you can't just shoot a one day old baby. Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, that's not good. We can. It's okay, been you done. You could. You could. It's been done recently. You could. You shouldn't. Huh? Um, but uh, you shouldn't shoot a kill a baby that's like one or oh, one day or one week or one month from mm-hmm. coming out of the birth canal. Anyway, that's that's a super specific example. But yeah, I think I think uh, it would be good if everyone were Catholic. I don't think it should be enforced. Uh, I think the government again, like I don't believe in these liberal mechanisms, these neutral mechanisms of liberal democracy. It's like okay. We have to treat every religion as just as good as the next one because that's that argument is implicitly atheistic. Because if you hold one religion yeah, to be true, it's, then why it's, would it not be it, privileged? It's, it's salvation's at stake. It's intellectually bankrupt. Yes. And people accuse me of holding that belief. I do not at all. I don't think they're all equal. I simply have preferences. Right. I like some better than others. Right. Some I really don't like. Some I like slightly. Sure. Some I like maybe a little bit more than that, but that's about it. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, having some kind of uh, s- states putting their fingers in the, on the scales to push people in a direction where they can live a more virtuous life and a, a life aligned with uh, what social arrangement should be is better. Okay, now, you keep using the word virtue, one of my favorite words, um, because it was used extensively by Plato, who I've, I talk about all the time and the founding fathers of the United States of America, who I also talk about all the time. And they use the word in somewhat similar ways. I'm just curious how you're using it. What, do you, what is virtue? How do you define it? Moral excellence. Well, come on. That's okay, so more specifically, okay, what should you do? Virtue is the should. Mm-hmm. And the should is an elusive creature. We kind of have, this is a, a, great, a great book to read on this, by the way, is After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. Mm. Um, and uh, we, we kind of still have the vocabulary of virtue. He makes this point in the book. Um, so, if, like, look, this is a key I'm holding right now in my hand. Um, we still have the vocabulary to say this is an excellent key. And what does that mean? Does that mean I like this key? No, we have a different vocabulary for that. I'm not saying you should like this key. That's just, that's, that's just something semantically different. Mm. I'm saying this is a key that is good at what it's supposed to do. It is a purposed key, and it is excellent. If I say a view is good, I'm not saying I like this view. Uh, saying a view is beautiful is, is, a different, is semantically different from saying I like this view. Mm-hmm. That's something close to this view is a virtuous view. I don't, I don't, I don't, that's kind of a weird thing to say, but or this view is how a view should be. It's purposed. It's doing. It's it's fulfilling its purpose. A key is virtuous if it unlocks the lock every time. Sure. Right. That's, that's one way you could construct that. This is just what was in. I mean, a key, well, yes. I'm, I'm getting it. It serves its function. Yes. Correctly. Right. Is that right? Yes. Is that what that's what virtue is? Serving one's Do, or one uh, serving or things. Purpose. Function is a little purpose. Sorry. Yeah. Serving and the purpose I take it from you is determined by. God, the big guy. Yeah. Moral, law, moral lawgiver. You need a moral lawgiver to have moral law, in my opinion. Moral law, right. And, and you believe that, and I'm not making fun of you, <laughs> I swear to God, essentially because the Bible says so. Uh, yeah, yes. Revelation was revealed to us that this is true. That's it, though? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. I mean, I think this can be arrived at in other ways. Those don't concern me because I'm satisfied with what I have. Really? The Bible's good enough? Uh, for me, huh? 
I mean, and I, I respect the other people like that just isn't compelling for her. Uh-huh. Um, and that sucks. <laughs> like, I, I, uh, I try to argue in ways that aren't simply like the Bible says so, because that's just not going to convince people. Yeah. Um, I hate the new atheists and I don't want to sound like one. Sure. And I, I never have these conversations cause I usually just don't care. But given your background, your intellectual background, your political background, you used to work for reason magazine. You used to, you know, work in, you work in journalism. You educated, went to university of Virginia, uh, Again, I'm not making fun of you because I think that the Bible is exactly as correct as the Constitution of the United States, and I think it's exactly as correct as any book I've ever written. Okay. I think they are exactly the same right. in terms of their um, veracity. Right. Now, but you've chosen what I can uh, to me, they're all fiction. Okay. All right. Whatever. They're all inventions of human beings. So that doesn't mean they're worthless. It just means that I get to choose among them freely. Right. That's what I love about my way of thinking on this. This is the postmodernist right, way of thinking. Nice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but and so I choose certain books. You know, I like, I like you know Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil better than the Bible. I like the story in Nietzsche, the narrative in Nietzsche's Good and Evil, Beyond Good and Evil, more than the story in the Old Testament. He's a New Testament. great thinker. Sure. But I just like where he's taking me sure where he wants me to go much more than uh where jesus wants me to go right and so why do you choose knowing i'm assuming the history of the bible and well i don't know do you so you believe it wasn't written by human beings i mean of course it was oh, it was okay the gospel according to mark yeah okay so every christian believes that okay so you're choosing this <laughs> but just just it's, I don't know. I, mean, I never, I never, I never question like, you, religious people. About you this either stuff. believe. So, I mean, a tiring. Uh, I'm not blaming you for hmm? putting me putting me in this uh, line of discussion. I'm saying uh, another line of discussion that I find tiring is just like uh, existence of God discussions. Hmm? Um, a little more interesting, I think, is like okay. Assume we don't have positivism, and there are other authoritative sources of knowledge. So for me, it's. I'm adding something on to positivism. It's okay. There's uh, like reason and deduction, mm-hmm. and there's empirical stuff, mm-hmm. experience, and then there's revelation. Mm. Something can be given to us outside of deduction and outside of experience. Yes, and that's what revelation is. And if you believe in the supernatural, you believe that's possible. Uh, and I think it's more than possible in this scenario because I think this is the only revelation that is reasonable to believe if you want to choose a revel- if you think there could be something else and it was revealed to us by a, some, 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 something sympathetic to mm-hmm. us I, mean, I think this is pretty obviously it uh, so revelation sounds to me like it contains messages yeah revelation in this case is the gospel mm-hmm. that was revealed to us it was given to us in a way we could not have deduced ourselves right um, and you're, and it's supernatural. Yep, it's not coming from us. That's not correct. human beings. Not human consciousness. Not human language. Even. Yep. Couldn't. I'm totally with the idea that there's things outside of the rational. I think to me they're just feelings. Okay. Things like that. The you know affect. Sure. With an A, right? Affect. Uh, why couldn't it be that? Uh, the, re- the reason. This is, this is a big discuss. This is maybe the biggest discussion. Yeah, well, that's what we uh, do here. Yeah, I mean, again, like I said, like I'm not like theology isn't something I find super interesting or like I'm super versed in. But yeah, but uh, I, 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 my my Reader's Digest answer is I'm not compelled by the zeitgeist of here and now. Of well, of course, okay. It's like it's, it's materialism is neutral and natural and obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think that uh, looking back on well, let me put it this way. So, like I'm 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 generally don't try to. I think it's easier to convert people to political political beliefs than to religious beliefs. Um, and my my religious beliefs do, in a big sense inform my political beliefs but if I, if I woke up tomorrow and I said okay this is all this is all bullshit this isn't real uh, 
I don't think my politics would change that much. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I'd be a little softer on abortion. Uh, I think that's about it. Because I think a more interesting question to consider, or maybe a less tiring question to consider than the low of the low of the theology is like, okay, where are people going? Where are we coming from? Like, what is this arc of history and where are we going? Uh, and I think you can, by looking at these, like I, I said earlier in the pod, uh, I just said earlier in the pod, I'm going to say podcast. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, I was like, the, the, impersonal, the impersonal forces of history are something to be reckoned with. And I think there's basic entropic principles, and it's entropic like entropy, like where do things go when the energy fades away? Yeah. Uh, I've said this on another podcast, Justin Murphy. I don't know if you know yeah. him. Yeah, he's great. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it was, a, it was a video cast. There was a video of me. Um, this is what we should be looking for because everything, everything else will be painful. Trying to stop entropy from happening is painful. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of our social arrangements, I think, with, uh, with uh, the coming of the modern order are trying to push us away from, I'd say, I hate to say, because this is a loaded word, organic ways of living. Mm-hmm. Ways of living where, you know, you, uh, you the gender roles exist. Um, like, I mean, the, the reasons we have the word for man and woman or anything like that is because there are social positions that are attendant upon gender. Mm-hmm. And those, you know, those are probably good. Those are, I hate to say natural because you know things can be natural without being good, mm-hmm. but those can point in, in directions that are like sustainable and entropic in the way I'm describing uh, for for human beings to exist. So I think if you want if you want people to live you know good lives or non alienating and even in a way uh, Marx is describing, I think uh, if you if you take if you take that seriously enough for Marx and his theoreticians, then you can go in a very non Marxist direction. Um, then you you end up with something that looks like political theology. It looks like the metaphysical arrangement of how people should act. Uh, and I, that's totally easy to square with my belief in a supernatural and literal personal God. That's because, I mean, God, God loves humans. God would want things that like, are good and sustainable and healthy for human beings. Have you read the Old Testament ever? I don't think he likes humans very much. God gets angry. <laughs> he's, a, he's maybe the greatest mass murderer in history, <laughs> in the Old Testament at least. Um, so wait, here's a word you keep using. Entropy. Yeah. Entropic. Sure. Right. It's a little impenetrable, so. Sorry. No, no, no. But I, that is that, I was a little unclear. That's the problem that you identify. No, that's, you, you like entropy. That's the way things are going. But, Where will humans be directed? But you want to move away from it. We should stop being wasteful by trying to... I mean, there's a lot of baggage with this word, so I kind of regret using it again. But uh, that's like the organic... So the teleology. So, you know, I, I think an important political or, I guess, philosophical concept to consider, especially if anyone who cares what I believe, uh, is, you know, the philosophy of causes versus the philosophy of ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, teleology versus, I guess, what would the other one? I don't know. Uh, causes, but mm. um, and you know, a lot of what the Enlightenment did was it abandoned the belief in like things evolving towards a direction. Like there are only causes and things compelling things into space with nothing ahead of them. Um, mm. and I mean, so, to me, I, I think I think the end. This is maybe a, a mild disagreement, but I think the end for the Enlightenment has always been social order. Control and efficiency, least. certainly efficiency, yeah. certainly control. Uh, I think it didn't even social order. It didn't even get those right. Uh, well, it, it kind of, it kind of, its promises haven't quite been delivered on. Thankfully, yeah. yes, we still have hip hop to, uh, pro- to prove that enlightenment is not hegemonic yet. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think like if you view social organization as a teleological thing, then you can you can find the shadow of political theology. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's much more digestible to most people that can get them on my side much more easily. Because I mean, like, th- there's better people than me if you want to talk about like why should you convert to Catholicism. It's like, look, I believe it, I believe it pretty strongly, but yeah, it's not. No, I thought you did. Yeah, but you don't like entropy so much. You don't I mean, like 
entropy when just things falling apart, that's one way to look at it. But entropy, the way things naturally go, I'm using a really bounded uh, deployment of the word entropy. It's just like, where does water flows down a hill in a certain way? Mm-hmm. Water will flow down a hill in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, you can use energy to move it around, mm-hmm. but you know dams are going to come crashing down eventually. Mm-hmm. And so I think trying to like throw things in the, the spanner in the works of how humans you know will be or will behave uh, with a healthy social organization is just going to cause pain. Going back to your first metaphor, I mean, you want to divert the water down the hill, don't you? Um. Or make pools, puddles? Yeah, you can make little eddies. Eddies? Yeah. That's what you want. Is it right? I want those eddies to consider the hill. Okay. <laughs> so you want alternative communities, alternative nation states? Maybe. I think nation states uh, right now can be saved. I think they can. All right. I think there's a, there's a realignment going right now. We've seen, uh, we've seen uh, Orban in Hungary, Trump, uh, mm-hmm. we've seen Bolsonaro. And you know, uh, uh, this, it's not all—it's uh, not all good stuff with them. Um, like you know, Bolsonaro is pretty corrupt. It looks like, but like, if this maybe happened fifty uh, or a hundred years ago, with trying to save Brazil from itself, maybe we would—we wouldn't need such an imperfect and brutal person. Tell me what's good about Bolsonaro from the Jacobite perspective. I mean, I actually don't. I don't. I'm. I'm. What I'm describing here is like the general re- realignment of the world towards something uh which is maybe the old normal this is kind of the norm that we've deviated from okay um you know bolsonaro like all the i actually don't know that much about him most of what you need to know about him is he's he's kind of a a like trump plus 20 percent uh kind of a strong man type you know national conservative um and i think us clutching our pearls at this is like naive and like weird and it's like were you born yesterday it's like this is how it's kind of always been Mm -hmm. this might be the the kind of organic and obvious social or like way way to govern Mm -hmm. um what are you dissatisfied with i mean that's the thing right you're dissatisfied with this society that you live in that we live in now Modernism, whatever this mm. is, or post whatever this moment is, right? Right. This is the beginning of your politics, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. So what is it? So you say entropy, and I get that resonates with me because I in entropy I hear chaos, I hear I hear maybe alienation. Well, I mean, I, I think alienation is a result of us trying maybe to divert, at, divert maybe divert atomization, maybe social. Atom, I'm, I certainly think social atomization okay. is terrible. Okay, right. Um, okay, so that's really clear now. Is yeah. that is that what you don't like? That's something I don't like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think atomization. Like, for, here's one example. Um, most people could not have or do not have enough as many kids as they would like. At least most women in the United States report that. So really, it's like well, the fertility rate's like one point eight. But women report wanting more. Really, and it's because the cost and you know financial and emotional interesting uh, of having a kid is higher than it used to be, and largely it's because people just move around. They don't have strong family bonds. Like, what are grandparents for? They don't have fucking anything to do. Mm-hmm. They you leave your kids with them. And they enjoy that. That's right. right. Uh, but now, like, we have to have these kind of institutional things like daycare that. You, that you know cost money and like aren't great the kids don't like it like you know that's obviously suboptimal um and we kind of figured it out for a very long time before this like that was this wasn't an intractable problem and this was solved by people having stronger and warmer social bonds it also resulted in maybe what it's all about like a sense of meaning and belonging mm. uh so i think yeah, it's people would be a lot happier there'd be a lot less ssris prescribed if you know, we 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 had non dischargeable bonds between people. We actually rediscovered obligations rather than just contracts. Obligations that you never decided to enter into. It's like I, I have an obli- I feel an obligation to my mother, for example, and I think most people do. Mm-hmm. I think these are actually these things that can, which is not rational. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. It's, I mean, I don't know. Not, I don't know. I, I don't know if I agree. It's with a that. choice. 
Is it a choice? It could be. It could be a rational choice, but it's not. Ne- I, don't, you're, 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 I, I don't know if I understand your deployment of rational. You, rational is such a weird word. You were born to that woman yeah. purely by coincidence. Okay. So choosing to be loyal to her, to be in allegiance with her, to devote your life to her in any way is on that level not what a scientist would tell you to do, not what an economist would tell you to do. What would be rational? Though? I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not agreeing with yeah, that. Yeah, I know, but I. Uh, I don't know. This is a. I think this is a. You know, I, I'm. This is supporting your argument. Yeah, yeah. We. It's I, a, I think this is a weak way to support my argument. Okay. okay. I think this is a caricature of rationalism. I think. Uh, hmm. uh, that's like a Mr. Spock caricature. It's like it's not rational feeling. It's like uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how many people deploy rational in that sense. Well, why are you choosing? I don't to know. care about your mother. Sure, maybe it's pre-rational. I mean, some of us hate our mothers. Some okay. of us don't speak to our mothers, right? Yeah, I mean, it's this is. I think this is precisely why it's important to reconsider this idea of put choice on a pedestal, because the things that produce you as a human, someone who can even have choices, who can even execute on their preferences, is determined by, like, these pre-consent, uh, you know, pre pre pre-choice characteristics of you. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think to there needs to be a rebalancing away from like on one side there's obligations, unchose things that you were embedded in from the start, and then this is like totally free. You can do whatever you want and just discharge them on contract as long as it's not illegal. I think the the needle moving back towards the obligations would serve the human person a yeah. little better. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the problems are like, huh? Why, why is <laughs> everyone depressed these days it's like i don't know i'm not a, i don't know much about psychology but I, something tells me these things might be related I, I keep thinking about how you must have felt in that restaurant with your, <laughs> with your girlfriend and those yeah. two lesbians yep you must have felt really really alone i felt very alone but i also was like oh this is i i this is obvious like it, it, i was shocked for a second and then i was like ah i should have known <laughs> yeah you you know that you were all alone right in this yeah. world, in this world that we, you and I inhabit, sure. right? And so, I mean, I take it you go, to, you must go to church. I do every Sunday, and yeah. probably more than that, right? Uh, let's and try to make the holy days of obligation. Otherwise, I mean, the Catholic Church is known for you know putting on the best party in town, basically, <laughs> right? I mean, on a regular the, basis, the, the traditional Latin Mass uh, at Star of the Sea in the Richmond district. For any San Francisco listeners here, eleven thirty every Sunday. It's very good. Best cool. choir I've ever heard. Yeah? yeah, I might even join you. You should check it out. Seriously, okay. Yeah. But I've been to I've been to Catholic masses before, and I was immediately taken with them, and I immediately understood the appeal. Yeah, so I mean, some people definitely just enjoy it on like a community aesthetic level. Yeah, and I think that's like, like, it doesn't need to be like you don't need to start it like as an intellectual exercise. I think that's maybe the worst way to start it. Mm. Uh, like that, that's good enough because most people like. You know, your listeners are probably smarter than the average person. Indeed. Um, most people. Much smarter. <laughs> the smartest. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, most people aren't like that. And they considering these questions as either hard or like weird and boring. It's about feeling, Rob. is what I've been trying to tell you. Sure. It's about affect. You, yeah. You've had feelings. You had feelings of loneliness, anomie, alienation in this modern, postmodern world. And you found communion. You when found it, community. You when, found other people yes. to talk to who will love you unconditionally. In the church, yeah, and you found clarity. God damn, I keep doing that. Sorry. You keep messing with. He has problems with modern technology. <laughs> um, you found there's a clarity in the hierarchy. There's the father, right? And, yeah, you, and my my priest uh, is is in a special class of people. He's a, he's above me. Yeah, and, and you, that's not bad. That doesn't mean he doesn't mean he's a more worthy person. Than there me. is liberation I find in submitting to Absolutely. authority. This is Thaddeus Russell talking, <laughs> but you know, I have the only place I've found it ever is in like boxing gyms, you know, and I actually sure. love the authoritarian totally. uh, character of those gyms. I can, I've never been to a boxing gym. I can totally see it. You get yelled at. Yeah. It's like a military. It's the military for an hour. You're basically in the military for an hour. You know, you're just, you're yelled at to do exercises for an hour and you just say, yes, coach, yes, coach, yes, sir, yes, yeah. sir, yes, sir. And that's it. And there's no challenging unless you're an idiot challenging the authority ever. And I love it. The other 23 hours of my day, I'm Mr. Radical Badass, you know, all authority sucks, sure. but there's something in me that I'm not gonna say need, but certainly really, really desperately wants probably for 
reasons of my childhood and, you know, being from a quote broken family, et cetera, things that you're going to really, uh, like, you know, to hear yeah. about. So dude, I get it. Yeah. I mean, like I get it. People coming back from it. The war is a great example. Okay. Like they, they miss the enforced brotherhood. Like they can't retreat from each other when they're in a, a, a combat mm-hmm. scenario sure. or even in like just sleeping in, in the barracks mm-hmm. scenario. It's like, they like because a point I always like to make is that like m- most men don't have confidants, at least confidants that are men anymore. That's right. Um, because I think this is because they just aren't close enough. Yeah. Like yeah, you can go out, you can drink, you can have fun, you can go on a vacation together, but rare, really rarely do people like have the negative stuff together. Yeah. Uh, men certainly. Right. Like if you have relationship problems, you don't tell another dude usually. Yeah. Right. That's what you're getting yeah. at. I mean anything. Yes. Totally. Yes. But, and I think that's because as soon as adversity comes in this friendship scenario, like oh, fuck this, I'm going home to watch Netflix. You can opt out the power of, of opting mm-hmm. this, this opt fuel. Uh, and I think this, this, this power of opting Nick land, one of my writers, some of your viewers or yeah. excuse me, listeners might be familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, he made a, a great point about like atomization as this thing kickstarted by the West and the Protestant Reformation happened. It's, it's this principle of, and this is, this is where I, I disagree with the, the ethic of simply fracturing into more and more states and just leaving each other if things get rough. Uh, this principle of simply opting out of things. Like, okay, you know, oh, I don't like how this church runs. I'm going to become the, you know, first reformed Dutch Presbyterianist Church of Ohio, you know, something like that. Like, mm-hmm. This principle that started with the Protestant Reformation has, I think, become kind of a, a, tr- a trap that's really hard to get out of. Right, the Reformation is the ultimate, well, hang on now. Okay, so I was going to say it's the ultimate exit. Sure. But you're an exit guy. I'm, I, 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 as, I, as I said in, uh, earlier in the podcast, I'm not an exit partisan. I think it's, under, it's undervalued. Aha. It's good in a lot of situations. Okay. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I, I, I'm against any ideology most of the time that says this is the absolute principle that if, if adhered to by taking it to 100, mm-hmm. we'll solve the problems. I think almost no ideology is like that. Uh, and I think... I think my distaste for that comes from, I, 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 I'm not happy to admit this, I used to be a libertarian several, many years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and libertarians do have that kind of mindset for mm-hmm. most things. Like, oh, all we have to do is reduce government intervention and then uh, everything's great. Mm-hmm. But you know, what's a more uncomfortable ideology is that there's a mix that requires a lot of thinking to figure out and a lot of case by case thinking to figure out. Like it's not just set it and forget it in a lot of situations. So like. Yeah, the principle of fragmentation, uh, I think, has led to this idea of atomization, it's just, you, like the, the the putting the idea of opting on a pedestal. Uh, even, I mean, the, the funny part is, I think the the real juice of this Nick Land article was that even trying to resist this atomizing force, if you want to resist social atomization. Uh, by saying the, the Rod Dreher thing we discussed earlier, then you, you are engaging in the same activity that fuels this phenomenon, this socio-historical phenomenon. He's opting to create another community. Mm-hmm. That's the force he's trying to resist, this force of dissolution where people opt into different corners. So, I mean, like, I don't know how you bootstrap it. I don't know how you put the cat it's amazing. in the bag. That's a total, not only is that a postmodern argument, that's a queer theory argument. Is right? it? Yes, that's exactly what queer theorists have been saying for years and years. I'm a complicated guy. They, I know, it, without knowing it, you're a queer. No, I mean, the, <laughs> the queer argument has been against the current trans movement, which says, okay. uh, you know, you're, you've created this new community with these new rules, right? I was born this way and you sure. were born that way. And that means X, Y, and Z about you, right? They right. hate the original queer intervention was to say, you're not, your destiny is, your body is not your destiny sure. and you can choose to be a man or a woman or whatever you right. want to be, right? There are no rules. But that's not politically satisfying to the rest of the folks. Apparently so, yeah, not. Well, then fucking choose the right way. Apparently not. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm having trouble with you. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a contradiction or if it's so nuanced that it's more of a paradox, <laughs> but I hear this embrace of exit, right? And 
that's in your basically your mission it is in your mission mission right. statement which i think that you state in your mission statement as a strategy of creating a multitude perhaps infinite alternative places to go regimes to go certainly not infinite and it's at least more uh, 50 to 200 at least so consider this in context that mm-hmm. i think most orders like most governments right now are not doing what they should be doing um this is a a strategy relevant to a time and place where you can break off and do it right Mm. then once you do it right i think people should stop breaking off like Mm. you eventually find some equilibrium oh so you're you're utopian in that way um i think things can be done right yeah things have been done right in some measure before i think we can get closer i think uh there's always gonna be problems yeah all right i always want splits i always want people breaking off and doing their own thing sure again i I want more places to go on vacation but i mean uh, the the the, there's there's a kind of a naive interpretation of that which i think comes from like you see i don't know if you heard the news uh, several months ago some guy with his girlfriend tried to just do the most ridiculous version of what we're discussing in like international waters near Thailand. Hmm. Uh, and he like had some kind of platform he built in the ocean or something. Like seasteading? Yeah, it was okay. similar. It was like a, a very particularly dumb version. Of, I think seasteading is kind of a dumb concept anyway. Oh God, it just sounds horrible. You get to it doesn't make sense. Li- live on an sense. island in the middle of the ocean with Peter Thiel? I don't want to do that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, like I, I can <laughs> kind of respect the impulse. Like, look, this is everything's being done so fucking badly that we need to just... Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, this guy tried his own implementation of it, mm. and then he had this kind of naive libertarian view of the rules. It's like, oh, well, I'm technically international waters, and the Thai, the Thai Navy had different ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're like, uh, like, no, fuck you. We have guns. We have boats. <laughs> you're coming with us. Oh, by the way, uh, you're 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 questioning Thai sovereignty. Which is treason. Treason is punishable by death. Ooh. It's like so. This uh, constructivist view of how power and sovereignty works uh, clashed with how it actually works. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, you know, they have boats and guns, mm-hmm. and who, who's gonna who, who's gonna come and stop them? You were actually a mile away from Thai waters, like, mm-hmm. uh, and so I mean, what I'm trying to get at this is that. Yeah, sure. Like Uber can give the middle finger to the law, at least for a while, and turn, win. You also have to consider like there is social mediation for doing these things, and social mediation is good. Mm-hmm. So I totally believe in policy. Policy should be wielded in the right direction, mm-hmm. and policy should definitely uh, uh, be wielded in the right direction, even if that includes some split off causing causing major problems mm-hmm. um here's okay here's the here's my problem with you maybe uh it sounds like is this right you're a little evangelical but a lot imperialistic um in other words do you what do you, mean by you, you, you do want to impose you do want to impose particular laws and more morality on me yes by, by at the point of a gun yes state power cool. yep all right just want to be clear it's all good okay um and you want that? Do you want that to be universal? You want the global? You want to have a global con- Catholic conservative polity? I don't. I don't. I don't want there to be one state. It's like there are there are types of people. Like even if everyone were Catholic, there would still be different types of Catholics. Okay. We have different pious Catholic countries right now. We have Poland. You know, we have yeah. Honduras. Yeah. Uh, and it's good they're different. They have other considerations besides their religion. Okay. Um, you want everybody to be Catholic, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in salvation. I pray for the salvation of every human being. Okay, but you're cool with the liberation theology people in Catholicism having their own sovereign state? Uh, the, no. The, the communists? They, they should be excommunicated. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, it's a question, like, should we invade them? Like, I don't know. Like, and I'm, you, I'm you, generally against war. Okay. Uh, some war is justified. Hmm. It's like a, some... ISIS is building a nuke. We probably don't want them to be able to send that two hundred mm-hmm. miles away. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, again, like 
this is kind of the necessary anxiety of what I think having a mature view of things is that mm. you can't just take one principle to its extreme and let everything work itself out. Right. Like you need to look at things by case by case basis. See, exactly. When I heard that you guys were into exit and then I heard that you were a, a traditional Catholic, I thought, great. What I want is multiple exits and multiple places to go so that you can have your own Christian, Catholic, conservative, utopia, wherever. Sure. I want you to have that with your people. And, and I think you'll, you will be a lot happier there than in San Francisco, certainly. Totally. There will be no lesbians yelling at you in a bar there. And girlfriends will be easier to come by, <laughs> I would imagine, at least who agree with you. Yeah. And that's why I'm for exit. Sure. Right? Because I want, I want... Liberal archipelago is the principle. I suppose. Is that it's what like, it is? Yeah. Okay. It's like you do you, I do me, you're okay. over there. Good fences make good neighbors. I totally agree with that. But no, because you want me to live according to your rules, regardless of where I live. You Is talking, that right? You, you were talking about if I had everything I wanted. Oh. There's a practical considerations. That's like the pluralism I believe in is a pluralism of practical implementation. It's like, yeah, it's like we're not going to make fucking Saudi Arabia Catholic. And we shouldn't try. Okay. It's like, and so we should, there's, there's an element of just respecting their dignity of not trying to be aggressive with that. Okay. That doesn't mean that everyone is right because they can choose their own good. Mm -hmm. That's a very specific mm -hmm. uh, philosophical position that I don't hold. Okay. Um, so, I mean, mm. I actually agree with you as, as, as far as probably is practical in the world. Like, I don't think there's ever going to be anything close to what I want. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that I will, uh, I will live under an antagonistic state yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, breaking off sounds all right. Just so you know, like, I don't have any beef at all, personally. This doesn't bother oh, sure. me or yeah, yeah. offend me or I anything. Didn't think Hold that. on, though. Hold on, though. But it does mean that we will be shooting at each other eventually. That's all. But it's cool. Like, I don't mind that. Once like, we're in the Mad Max world. Yeah, I mean, right? I mean, that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> seriously, our politics at the end of the day, same with Marxists, at the end of the day, like, we may agree on immigration and the Iraq war and whatever. But at the end of the day, those guys are going to be shooting at me. Sure. Right. When they yeah. win or they take any kind of political power, we're going to be shooting at each other. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm afraid that's true for you too. Right. I Am think I right? so. Okay. That's yeah. cool. And that's what I love. Like, I just want to know that yeah. <laughs> so that I know how to operate. So until we get there, you and I can coalesce around all sorts of issues because we hate liberals and enlightenment that's and all nice rationalism. That's the nice thing about a big enemy. And I can coalesce with Marxists around war and liberals and the wall and whatever. Yeah. But knowing full well that, you know, if we all get our way, there's going to be yet another civil war yeah. between us. And yeah. it's cool. But we agree to disagree War, for peaceful moment. coexistence. That's well, possible. I don't know about you. Okay. Because <laughs> you're going to. Okay. Let me ask you this. Sitting in downtown San Francisco, what do you think of homosexuality? Uh, so I, I have super nuanced views of this. Well, cool. that's okay. Cool. I'm, I'm gonna dial back. The I super. can't wait. I'm gonna dial back the super. Uh, I have <laughs> I have nuanced intuitions about this. Okay. <laughs> uh, because you know, I, I, I there are people very close to me that are gay, mm -hmm. that are like gay couples, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I believe it's I believe the church is teaching on it though. Um, okay. I believe it's a disordered okay. way to live. Okay, it's a sin. Yeah, it's homosexual behavior. Although, is a sin. Di sorry, Hom homosexual behavior is a sin. sin but I, th but I think what you said, uh, disordered. What was it? Disordered behavior is even a worse uh, condemnation in yeah, my in my mind. Homosexual. Yeah. Uh, I don't know which was worse. But well, just to me, it sounds okay. worse. Yeah, because I don't care about. Yeah, sin, I mean, but <laughs> all the, the the you sound like a progressive when you say the disordered phrase, behavior. Yeah, the phraseology right. of like of Catholic stuff is like. Really, it's, some of it seems like dated or weird mm -hmm. or like super jargony, yeah. but that's just you know, it's just there's. Well, I like I didn't know I love it. I love that you use disorder because it's so honest. Disordered, sure. it's, yeah, that's they, what bothers they're you. Living in an un, they're not ordered correctly. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think uh, huh. I f first of all I think that, like I mentioned before, various LGBT things are deployed as sanitization for power. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I totally resent like that. Like smoke screens, basically. Yeah. Or, it's just like, or camouflage for power plays. Sure. It's like, look, we, we're in power and we're doing the things that like you, that 21st century liberal like, progressivism tells you is good. You have to so cow we are good. You have to kowtow to yeah. the LGBT line to become mayor of San Francisco yes. or governor of California or probably president of the United States eventually. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, even Trump had a... Freaking right. rainbow flag yeah. during the election, right? Right, and then what, TPUSA <laughs> had 
a drag queen yeah. talking points. Yeah, totally. Uh, talking points. Totally. Wait, no, no, I'm thinking of talking points memo. Turning point USA. Turning point. Yeah, you got uh, it. Charlie Kirk, the the young conservative. Charlie Kirk. Even the Republicans are queer yeah, now. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. they're signaling to what Milo is apparently Milo. Milo, who, who I, you got I've, in trouble for I've hiring. Had a dalliance with Milo. That's right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and it's it's we're at the point where. Uh, homosexuality being like good and right. And just so, so people don't, this is funny. I just occurred to me. We homosexual. I did not bring that up because of your Milo history, but you were fired right yes. from the day. So you were the opinion editor for the Daily Caller. Yep. And then what happened? Uh, so, a bit of an interesting. It's, it's actually a very, it's a very fond memory of mine because it's like my 15 minutes of fame. Cool. Uh, I, I was uh, the Kevin Spacey groping thing happened. Like it came out that he he had assaulted a 14 year old boy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of my favorite writers of the caller is a Orthodox Jewish gay man, who's, celibate, I believe. Who's this? David Benkov, okay. uh, excellent writer, um, hmm. uh, trained historian. Uh, and I, I went to him like, "Hey, do you have some commentary on this, David? Because he always has great things to say, especially about like stuff he, stuff he's adjacent to." Hmm. Um, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna write about how." Uh, kind of, age differences in gay relationships used to be pretty mainstream and out in the open mm -hmm. and uh, this definitely involved teenage boys mm -hmm. and older men um, you know Nambla <laughs> like floats were in major gay pride parades mm -hmm. literature was in gay bookstores true and you know they cleaned up their act in the 90s came around um, true but you know the undercurrents are still there there's like still uh, you, you see a lot of these age differences that make everyone else uncomfortable and anyway he's gonna write about this um he pulled out because he said that there would be so much press that came after him if he talked about this sensitive issue that he just he wouldn't be able to take it. So he got cold feet. Uh, I told my uh, editor in chief, and another top editor said, "All right, get Milo." And I'd never dealt with Milo before. I have a problem with. It. I ran controversial pieces almost as my job. Mm. You know, Daily Caller is a, a bomb throwing organization. Mm -hmm. um, again, yeah, we had an Ann Coulter column, syndicated column every week. Uh, right. And so, yeah, I totally got him. He, he wrote something that I thought was, it was fun and good. Um, in which he says that, yes, it's true. That yeah, I mean, in, that's in what, many cases, gay men's first sexual experience was with a man when they were boys. Sure. That's right. Um, and uh, someone doesn't like that. Someone tells the publisher. It might, be, it might have been an advertiser. It might have been a donor. I was never sure. Hmm. Uh, but, yeah, the people didn't like it because people thought I gave Milo a, column, a title of columnist. Uh, that I give to every like, major big deal who gives me... He agreed to give me regular contributions, and every big mm. deal who gives me regular contributions gets the title of columnist. We didn't pay him. Uh, but, yeah, so this is after he got canned from Breitbart, mm. um, and everyone thought we were getting Breitbart sloppy seconds, so it was a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a big deal. Uh, people just had inaccurate information all around. And so, yeah, someone didn't like it. Someone told the publisher they didn't like it. The publisher did not like it himself. I took the fall. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> you were making day, the Daily Caller very gay there for a minute. Yep. Right? So, yet you think it's a disordered life. Yeah. I don't... Uh, like I said, I think people have purposed beings before. Like there's a, a way to live that... Uh, there's a way you should live that is separate. Sometimes it goes along with what feels good or what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is a thing people are for and that isn't... Homosexual behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last question. You wrote, sorry, you published two recent reviews of the Joker. Oh yeah. Tell us what your take is on the Joker. Um, you see, my personal take, uh, I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was excellent on like the technical aspects, acting, writing, uh, you know, cinematography, directing. Um, I love the. <laughs> The gritty, it was obviously Gotham, not New York, but I love like the gritty 1980s mm -hmm. New York style atmosphere of it. Um, yeah, I, I think what's really interesting about it is it was an actual incel movie. Mm -hmm. And one of the reviews in Jack by, by uh, the great writer Mike Crumpler uh, says this it wasn't indeed an incel movie. And hmm. the Joker was an incel hero. Yeah. Uh, and which kind of made it a little edgy con considering how big of a production it is and how it's, I think it's made a billion dollars at this point. Uh, 
And one of the things that Mike Crumpler says in the article is, where does the incel hero end and the proletarian hero begin? Uh-huh. Because I mean, the, the proletarian is someone who m- maybe, maybe it was a, a consensual social order, a social order where, uh, you know, you, you, you aren't actively being oppressed, but you know, the, the, the world of, the world of contracts doesn't serve you well. There is power relations hidden in these things. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, 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 this is an important movie because it's signaling at what we're going to have in the future. This made a billion dollars for a reason. And it was, it was a pretty dark and edgy movie with uh, these, these things that I'm describing now. So, like, more and more, I think men are becoming alienated. Yeah, in this direction, I think pr- there's stats on this. Fewer and fewer men are just have reported having sex in the past X years, yeah. um, and like this creates alienation in any society. But we have societies like uh, Sudan where polygamy is super common, which creates just a shortage of women for like the the lower status men, and they join terrorist organizations. Yeah, and so like there's something true that's being captured in this Joker movie, even though it's kind of a silly super villain origin story if you look at it from that perspective um but i think we're going to see more of it more that uh will end up being hailed as relatable by a huge number of people um yeah because of, of social choices that were made and that's i think like the decline of marriage being one of them mm-hmm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the incel and the joker aren't they sort of the they are profoundly alone sure profoundly perhaps lonely yeah people all alone in the world and the joker deals with it by laughing uncontrollably and by causing mayhem and so does the incel yeah i mean there, i don't know uh i'll spoil a little bit so if you haven't seen it and you don't want a minor subplot to be spoiled press pause now uh i mean there is uh, an incel story arc. Have you seen the Joker? Mm-mm, no. Okay. There is an incel story arc huh. where it shows him as being like incontrovertibly an alone person with no possibility of romance. Yep. Uh, and I mean, and anyone who's enjoyed romance, for them, that's like a really scary concept. For anyone who's been alone for, let's say, a six month period, yeah, and really like your entire life. That sounds like these people are in a lot of pain. Yeah, exactly. And that's why that's why the Joker Thank had you. a believable kind of pain. Thank you. Pain. Finally, we talk about what's really going on: loneliness and pain. Yeah. And probably panic, anxiety that you're going to be like this forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can. I and can uh, for a lot of people, an increasing number of people, that's becoming kind of the truth. Huh. Fuck that. Sad. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to join. I'm going to come with you on Sunday. Cool. And uh, we're going to get as many incels as we can to, to <laughs> join the Catholic Church. And they will find mates and well, wives, of course. Right. And, um, and then they'll have families, of course. And then they'll be happy. They'll have obligations to entirely new sets of people. Boom. Fixed it. We're good. We did it. Hey, man. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun, Pat. Good. Uh, we might do this again. I and I'd love, love to, to hang out some more. Yeah. At, in church or not. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To buy tickets for my upcoming events in Des Moines, Iowa, and Chicago, Illinois, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash talks. Thanks for listening.